Good morning, Powerful Christian Church. Thank y'all for being here so much. Uh, please stand and worship with us. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned a and my sorrows he made them his very own he bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died much. Boy, I like that version of that song. Got a little upbeat. I like that. I want to welcome you this morning to Pineville Christian Church. So glad to see so many of you here. If you're watching us online, we're obviously glad that you chose to be a part of the worship experience with us there. I hope that while we literally stand in a service and we sing songs, I hope more than that, our hearts, we're standing in amazement for all the wonderful, fantastic things that God has done. You know, we do have troubles in this life. We have struggles in all various forms, but when you look at our struggles and our cares in comparison to what many other folks have, man, we, we really have a marvelous God and wonderful, wonderful things that are going on in our lives. If you're visiting with us for the first time, we're certainly glad to have you here. There should be a little card there in front of you in one of those uh, chairs. Fill that out and you can put it in the offering plate when you leave and we can have a record of your visit and kind of let you know about some things um, that are going on. Have it, uh, I know we briefly mentioned this last week, but the website is back up as far as the prayer request. So if you want to go in, put a prayer request um, in there. We'll get that. And Todd and myself and some of the others will we'll be able to pray for you. You can designate whether you want that public or not. And oftentimes people don't. And that's okay. But I will say this. Todd and I were sharing just a moment ago. You know, It seemed like this past week a handful of folks were really under attack, going through a lot of difficult things um, that were stressful. And uh, you know, Todd and I uh, decided, look, let's just take a minute and really pray. Pray, pray for these folks and pray for this situation. And he was giving me a testimony back there um, earlier about how excited he was to see that, man, some things had really changed. And that's important to remember is just we can't change things. We can work hard and we can try our best, but God can change things. He can change people's hearts. He can change our minds, our hearts. So prayer is so, so very important. If you've got something you're struggling with, you know, work hard to figure it out and talk to others and get advice, but don't forget to, to do what's most important. 
which is pray and ask God to help you and to help others. Look, if he can do the miraculous things that we believe he did as recorded in the scriptures, guess what? He can take care of our challenges and our problems. So I want to encourage you to do that. I want to lift up some special requests today. I know um, Clay and Rebecca's family had a loss of uh, their aunt this week and had, the, I think, the funeral services yesterday. Continue to remember them. Um, Chris, who's normally over here, live wire on the guitar. Um, his mother's uh, home going service was this past week. Um, you know, I, I was amazed, you know, at how he was able to even sing. I don't know if they're watching this online or not, but, uh, you know, Jonathan was there with him. And, I mean, I, I just, he did a great job singing at his own mother's uh, service. And I thought, wow, that's, that's got to be tough to do. But continue to remember his father and um, all that he's going through with the loss of uh, his wife. Look, there's many things we can pray for, many good things that we can thank God for. And that's what we do when we come together. We, we lift up all of these requests. We thank God for our many blessings. So I want to encourage you as I lead us in a congregational prayer, maybe as you bow your head and close your eyes, you'll think of one. Think of something that you want to mention before God. You know, there's this passage in the Old Testament that talks about how our prayers are like an incense before God's offering. Make your prayer that. Make it to that today as I lift us up in a congregational prayer. Bow with me. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that you listen to us, that you care. Lord, you're so patient with us. You love us in spite of our mistakes. Lord, you watch out for us. Lord, your love and grace is just so marvelous. It's really beyond our own words. Help us, God, to recognize and to stand in, in literal amazement of your goodness. Now, we do confess that there are those who are struggling today, and some who are sick, and they need the healing power of Jesus Christ in their life. Or there are those who are, who are <clears throat> grieving the loss of a loved one. We pray that your Holy Spirit would comfort them in their time of need. God, as we pause for the next few moments and we <clears throat> sing praises to you, we say prayers, we listen, we teach children, Lord, we pray that everything that is done here. In spite of our weakness and failures and limitations, that it would bring honor and glory to your son Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Won't you stand with us as we continue to sing together? Tell me again, Dave, exactly what time that starts Wednesday. It's seven, right?
God, we wait your coming soon. So we wait, we wait for you. God, we wait your coming soon. Like a
downstairs. I know Mr. Todd's got some exciting things. And listen, don't worry. Part of what they're going to be doing is, is, is having a fire outside. That's going to be controlled. So if you see something burning, you don't have to take off running, okay? That's a, I don't know if Jonathan planned that about set a fire down in my soul, but we're going to set a fire outside and the boys and girls are going to be learning. But I hope that we're setting a fire in here because I'm going to tell you, I can't think of a more pertinent song than Lord prepare me to be a sanctuary. You know the sanctuary is a place where God dwells. That's what you and I are supposed to be. We're supposed to be a place where God dwells. And so I hope that you and I are sanctuaries for God this week and the learnings and you know, the teachings and the things that we learned today will help us get to that place. We're in Acts chapter 10. Those of you who've been here wouldn't won't be surprised. And we're on the second part of a little mini-series where we're looking at the life of Cornelius. Cornelius, we learned last week, was the first Gentile Christian, which is a very significant thing. He's the first non-Jew who comes to Christ in this new experience that we see that's going to be called Christianity. And this is really important to us because every one of us, that I, I think most of us in here at least that I know, are Gentiles, and so we're recipients of the grace of God as it passes from Jewish folks on over um, to Gentiles. And Cornelius was the first Gentile Christian. If you want to get a lot of information about him, you can go back and check out last week's sermon. But just as a point of reference in case you weren't here, Cornelius was a centurion in the Roman army, very committed, loyal Roman soldier. Um, <clears throat> And he but also was a God-fearing individual, and that's part of the reason that God reaches out to him. I want to read for you um, just a few passages today, about 10, um, and then we're going to hear the story. You know, I oftentimes hesitate, you know, to read because some people don't like to be read to. But, I, you know, if you go back through the history of the church, a big part of worship is reading the scriptures together. And so I don't ever want to um, miss out on doing that. So if you don't mind, stand with me as we read together as a congregational reading, or I read in, in, out loud, Acts chapter 10, we're, not, and we're just going to go down through 35. It says, The next day as Cornelius' messengers were nearing the town, Peter went up on the flat roof to pray. It was about noon and he was hungry, but while a real meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw the sky open, and something like a large sheet was let down by its four corners. In the sheet were all sorts of animals, reptiles, and birds. Then a voice said to him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat them. No, Lord, Peter declared, I have never eaten anything that our Jewish laws have declared impure and unclean. But the voice spoke again, Do not call something unclean if God has made it clean. The same vision was repeated three times. Then the sheet was suddenly pulled up to heaven. Peter was very perplexed. What could the vision mean? Just then, men sent by Cornelius found Simon's house standing outside the gate. They asked if a man named Simon Peter was staying there. Meanwhile, as Peter was puzzling over the vision, the Lord Holy Spirit said to him, Three men have come looking for you. Get up, go downstairs, and go with them without hesitation. Don't worry, for I have sent them. So Peter went down and said, I'm the man you are looking for. Why have you come? They said, Well, we were sent by Cornelius, a Roman officer. He's a devout and God-fearing man, well-respected by all the Jews. A holy angel instructed him to summon you to his house so that he can hear your message. So Peter invited the men to stay for the night. The next day he went with them, accompanied by some men of, of the brothers from Joppa. They arrived in Caesarea the following day. Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered his home, Cornelius fell at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter pulled him up and said, Stand up, I'm a human being just like you. So they talked together and went inside where many others were assembled. Peter told them, You know it is against our laws for a Jewish man to enter a Gentile home like this or to associate with you. But God has shown me that I should no longer think of anyone as impure or unclean. So I came without objection as soon as I was sent for. Now tell me why you sent for me. Cornelius replied, Four days ago I was praying in my house about the same time, three o'clock in the afternoon. Suddenly a man in dazzling clothes was standing in front of me. He told me, 
Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your gifts to the poor have been noticed by God. Now send messengers to Joppa and summon a man named Simon Peter who is staying in the house of Simon, a tanner who lives near the seashore. So I sent for you at once and it was good of you to come. Now we are all here waiting before God to hear the message the Lord has given you. Then Peter replied, I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism. In every nation he accepts those who fear him and do what is right. May God bless the public reading of his word. You may be seated. So basically now we see the story unfold of Peter's connection when he meets Cornelius. Now, to bring us up to speed, two things are taking place simultaneously, okay? Cornelius is over in Capernaum, Caesarea, sorry, see, got confused. He's in Caesarea, okay? Cornelius is in Caesarea, which is the port town we talked about last week, and it's about nine to ten miles north of Joppa, all right? So, He's in Caesarea, and he has a vision, a dream. And in this dream, an angel stands before him and tells him to send for a, per, a specific individual named Simon Peter who's in Joppa. At the, roughly the same time, Peter is at someone's house. We know it to be Simon the Tanner. We're going to get back to that in a minute because anytime the Bible gives us little unique details, there's typically a reason for it. So we're going to talk about that. So he's, he's at Simon the Tanner's house, and he's also uh, by the seashore, which the, part of the reason that he's by the seashore is tanning was where they took the hides of dead animals. They didn't have refrigeration and all those things like that. So it was typically not a highly looked upon profession, even for Jews. And so they were oftentimes by the seashore where the winds would take it away. It wasn't tucked back in the city. So he's, he's at Simon the Tanner's house, and he says the Bible, says Peter gets hungry, and it's at this point that we realize that Peter is way more patient than many of us because he gets hungry, and they're preparing a meal for him, and instead of being downstairs worried about what's going on with the meal and tasting it and checking it out and all that, he goes upstairs, it says, on the roof to pray. See, many of us, we like to have very quick prayers right before the meal. I don't like those long extended meal prayers, right, because I'm ready to eat. For whatever reason, Peter decides that while they're preparing this meal, which it probably takes a lot longer to prepare a meal under those conditions, but he's, he's up on the roof, he's on the seashore, possibly looking out over the ocean, which is probably what I would do. I mean, that's a beautiful place to pray and to reflect and to think about what God's doing as you look out over the Mediterranean Sea. And, all, and while he's there, it says he's really hungry, so he's probably thinking about food, not, not uncommon if you're waiting to eat, to think about that. He falls into... The Bible says a trance or a deep sleep, which is also not uncommon to you know, drift off, all right? You're looking out at the waves, possibly. He drifts off, and he has a very unique dream. In this particular dream, he sees a sheet, all right? A big sheet, and the word there is actually the same kind of word that's used for a sail, so it's a really big, big sheet, okay? And it, it comes down from heaven, and on it, are all sorts of animals, okay? And it's specific here that it says many of these animals were reptiles, birds, different things. Now, in the course of this dream, a voice says to Peter, what? Get up, kill, and eat, all right? Now, that doesn't seem very unusual. I mean, many of us try to kill things and we try to eat things, and this is part of life, okay? But... For a Jewish person, they had very specific rules about what could be eaten and what couldn't be eaten. If you go back to Leviticus chapter 11, there's a very, I mean very detailed description of all of the things that were clean and the things that were unclean. So in this particular vision, there appears to be a whole lot of things that have previously been stated in Leviticus as unclean that are now coming down on this sheet in this vision and a voice from heaven is telling Peter to eat it. Now, Peter doesn't know at this point if this is really from God. I mean, he's just a regular dream. But in the dream, what does he say? No way, man. I'm not eating that. I, that that's part of our religious, our rituals, our ceremonial law. We don't need to, I'm not eating that. No way, I've never eaten that. But what happens? The voice says, no. Don't call something unclean that God has made clean. This vision happens three different times, and it's driven home, all right? Like, you know, like if, you gotta, if God says something once, twice, three times, he drives home this point to Peter, all right? 
As a result, verse 17, Peter was what? Very perplexed. Now, I can understand this. If you have a dream and it's vivid and it challenges some of the things that you've thought about your entire life, it could be perplexing. And Peter was perplexed. Wanted to know, what could this mean? All right, he's thinking about it. And all of a sudden, the people that Cornelius had sent to Joppa as a result of the vision that Cornelius had, they show up at Peter's house or the house where Peter's staying. All right, and we know here, again, it says, meanwhile, Peter was puzzled over the vision, but the Holy Spirit tells him, hey, there's some people who are coming and you need to go downstairs and go with them, see them. Now, you may say, why, why is there so much need for God to drive this point home, this whole elaborate vision about what's clean and unclean, and the Holy Spirit speaking to Peter? You have to understand, Jewish people, especially during this time period, could not stand Gentiles. All right, Gentiles were absolutely outside of the ability, even in some of the rabbinical writings, to experience the grace and mercy of God. There are rabbinical teachings among Jewish scholars from during that period that talk about that you, did, you weren't even supposed to help a Gentile woman who was giving birth, let her die in the baby because you don't want another Gentile. So this is the level to which many of the Jewish people could not stand and had prejudice against Gentiles. And like almost all prejudice, they were founded in some nugget of truth throughout history. Because oftentimes, whenever barbaric peoples came in, they did very cruel and terrible things. And generations after generations built on these types of things. People did cruel things. And that's the way prejudice works. Because what happens is I'm prejudiced and I pass that on and then it grows and it grows and it grows and it grows until what? Until somebody changes it and somebody does something different. And so it's, it takes a lot for Peter to really think about this because he's trying to follow God. I mean, he's been healing people. He's been sharing God's message. And then out of the blue, all of a sudden, God has, is ready to teach Peter something new something different. And so he really has to drive home this point. The Holy Spirit says, I've, I'm a part of this. Let this unfold. So Peter goes down and he tells them, hey, I'm the guy you're looking for. And this is a very unique, unique situation. And then they begin to tell Peter who they are and why they're there. This kind of very unique, miraculous event, all the things that are happening. And then we see right here that, that Peter is already starting to make some progression in his thinking, okay? Because what does he do? It says he invites them to stay, all right? That's not, not normal, okay? You, you normally wouldn't do that, all right? But he does as a result of what God is showing him, what God is revealing to him. Now, there's something we're going to talk about in a minute, but do you realize what's happening here? When God starts showing you things, and he starts revealing things to you, you should do things differently than maybe the way you've always done them. Maybe there's some progression. Maybe there's some growth. If you look at your life and it's still there where it's always been, from the, listen, this ain't even the points yet, but this is so important, I don't want you to miss this. If everything in your life is just like it was the day you got baptized and became a Christian, something's wrong. Because God's trying to give you more information, more things to understand so that you can become more valuable and become more useful in his kingdom. And so Peter, he does something that he would never have done before. He invites them to stay, all right? The next day, he gets up with them and he leaves on his way to Joppa. Why? Because it's a big, long journey. So it's not something you can just, you know, hop in a cab, call an Uber. It's not like that. He's got to take the whole day to go back down there to Joppa. When he gets to Caesarea, all right, Cornelius is there. And I want you to get this scene because this is important, okay? So Cornelius is waiting for him, and not only, he's waiting for them. Remember, there's no phone. There's no email. There's no way to text ahead. There's no way Cornelius knows that they're coming right there. Cornelius has, I mean, you got to like Cornelius. I mean, he's got the faith to believe that, hey, this guy's coming. Now, it ain't just all just faith, right? Because Cornelius is who? He's a centurion. And who did he send? 
He sent, if you go back to last week's message, he sent one of his soldiers. So get this, Cornelius wanted Peter and he wanted Peter to know it really, it may not have just been a request. Like, we're coming. And, that, that, you know, you got to be serious about what God's doing sometimes. And so, so he's ready. He's there. He doesn't know they're coming, but he's waiting. And like just him, look what he says there. He's got his family. He's got his friends. He's got the relatives. I mean, they, they're having a party waiting on Peter to get back there. And that's interesting because you can imagine he's been telling them what? I mean, you know, if you're going to somebody's house, I mean, what, what's this party about? Listen, I just need you to be over here. God has done something unbelievable in my life. I had this vision. An angel stood before me and, 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 and said to go get this guy. So, I mean, on, on some level, imagine the crowd. I mean, some people are like, man, this is unbelievable. Some people are like, Cornelius drunk? Something wrong with Cornelius? What's going on? Has he done gone, got too radical? But whatever reason, he's gathered all these people here who are there to hear what Peter has to say. So he calls him, <clears throat> Peter gets there, and then we kind of have this interaction between Peter and Cornelius where, where you know, Peter says, look, I, I'm not supposed to be here according to my laws and according to the customs. I'm not supposed to even go into your house. I'm certainly not supposed to uh, interact with you, but I'm here because, and he lays out what God's done in his, in his life. Cornelius then tells him, hey, what all God did in his life, as, you know, and why they, how they all came together. And then ultimately, it leads to Peter replying after he comes in. He says this, I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism in every nation. He accepts those who fear him and do what is right. And so now, Peter and Cornelius are together under the direction and clear guidance of the Holy Spirit. Very unique situation. God works in a very mysterious way here to bring Cornelius and Peter together together. Because he's trying to do what? He's trying to reach out and include the Gentiles into the message of Jesus Christ. Now, as we think about this particular encounter, we've learned a little bit about Cornelius. And so now, in this description of how Peter meets Cornelius, I want us to look at really four things that, that kind of emerge from this story that um, are, I think, important for us to consider. And the way I'm going to do it today is I'm going to kind of lay them out, and then I'm going to have some questions that I want us to think about, okay? The first thing that we see here in this story that I think we should look to and apply to our lives is this, being receptive to God's message. See, both men here were receptive to God's message. Look, we know Peter was receptive, at least in the sense because he, what, he invites the men to stay for the night. He's open to a new message because of what has happened. In this particular situation, it was a dream. But it's not always a dream. Sometimes it's some other thing. Maybe it's the word, whatever. But they were receptive to God's message. Look, not only was he just receptive to invite them in, then he was receptive when he got to Cornelius. Look, he says, it's against our laws for a Jewish man to enter a home like this or associate with you, but God has shown me that I should no longer think of anyone as impure or unclean. And we know that Cornelius was receptive to God's message because he says, hey, we're all here. We're waiting before God to hear the message the Lord has given you. Being receptive to God's message is critical if you want to be drawn closer to God. I jotted down a few questions for us to consider related to this. The first one. Am I willing to receive God's truth today? I mean, when it comes to receiving God's truth, do I get lost in maybe the failures of the messenger? Do I get lost in possibly the um, weaknesses of the delivery? Do I get lost in the discomfort of the environment? Do I get distracted by maybe all of the peripheral things that are going on so that I don't have to receive God's truth? You can't receive God's truth if you're not open to it. Are you willing to receive God's truth? The second question is, do I know why I think or believe certain things? I mean, your belief system, your 
belief about people, about things, your doctrine, your ideas? Do you even know why you believe them? Have you thought about it? Have you studied it? Have you looked at why you believe the things that you believe? Or is it just something someone told you? Is it something a preacher said? Is it something a teacher said? Which all those are valid things. But do you know why? Have you actually looked for yourself? You know, Peter had been taught his whole life that all these people were unclean. But maybe it was a little more to that story. Maybe there was some context missing. And now God is trying to show Peter that what he'd always thought wasn't exactly right. And that leads to this question, which is very important today. Is am I open to receiving new information and changing my perspective? You know, most people aren't. Most people have formulated what they think about others, about themselves, about situations. And as a result, basically, they just formulate, listen to this, and there's a lot of talk about this, they formulate these information loops that just support what they think. They interact with people who support only what they think. They read things that only support what they think. They go to places where people only encourage them to think in certain ways. And we have to be careful with this because sometimes in a sincere effort to try to do what's right, we can blindly adhere to rules and regulations that might be contradictory to what God is trying to do. And a lot of times this is how prejudices and biases and things form is are we open and willing to receiving new information and changing our perspectives? Think about how this hurts us in relationships with our spouses. We formulate what we think or how while we're right and they're wrong. Or we think about this in relationship to our children or think about this in relationship to our job. And then ultimately in this particular scenario, we think about it in terms of whole groups of people. They're in or they're out and I'm in. I'm, I, you know, all these types of things. Very important questions to think about. Number two, we see in this particular interaction with Cornelius and Peter something that I think we need to think about today, and that's this, is that we need to be ready, ready for action. You see, God is working. God is moving. In this particular situation, God is specifically working through Cornelius and Peter to accomplish something big, but he's working, the Bible says, all the time, all around us. And I want you to look at this particular verse. That's so cool here. He says, and as Peter, he's, he's trying to figure out what it means. Look, this is natural. We're trying to, look, if you're sincerely trying to follow God, you're going to be stuck at times trying to figure out what this means. You might read a passage and you go, what does that mean? Or you might have something happen in your day and you're like, what does that mean? I don't really understand fully. This is part of the human experience, all right? But in this particular situation, look what it says. God, God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, speaks to Peter to help him be ready for action. Look what it says right here. And I want you to go to this next slide. If you're a person who jots things down, underlines, circles, there's some things right here that I want you to look at. Look, look at this, this step right here. There's four things that I want us to ingrain in ourselves here in this idea of being ready for action. Look what it says right there. He tells Peter, the Holy Spirit, get up, go without hesitation, and don't worry. Look, if some of us today could embrace those four little concepts as it relates to being ready for action, it would change how things happen in our life. The first one is some people just need to get up. I mean, it's time to stop staying right where you are, okay? You have to get up at some point you have to get up and do something if you want to see change happen. Now, it's not always that you have to get up because we're going to see later what happens with Cornelius. He's waiting on Peter. But Peter's told to do what? Get up and go. Let me ask you a question. Is there something in your life that you need to get up and just start doing? Do you need to get up and go? Do you need to get up and quit thinking like this? Do you need to go and get away from where you are to get to somewhere that God wants you to be? Or are you kind of stuck and you really need to hold this, on, this idea about without hesitation? I was joking on the Wednesday night, we um, were talking about the Bible verses with the kids. And we were kind of going through the Bible verses and they all had it. And I was like, oh, hey, do any of y'all know the book of hesitations? And they were like, uh, uh, yeah, that's the Old Testament. And somebody's like, that ain't a book in the Bible. And I was picking with them, but listen, 
There's a lot of people who are stuck in the book of hesitations in their life. God's told them to get up. God's told them to go do something. God's told them to do this, to make a commitment here, serve there, give there, do that. But guess what? They're stuck in a world of hesitations. And I can speak to this because I am in the middle of an addiction to procrastination, fighting it all the time, always struggling to try to get up and do something that I need to do because I'm a procrastinator by nature, and it's not a good thing, all right? Because hesitations and procrastinations will keep you from where you need to be. And many times, you're hesitating because what? You're worried. Anxiety. Doubt. Fears. And you need to hear that fourth one. Don't worry. If God says to go, if God says to get up, if he said he's going to take care of you, if he's got a plan, you don't have to worry. You don't have to worry. How many people, wow, are paralyzed by worry? People allow anxiety, doubt, fears to keep them where they are. And here's the thing. You don't, life's not static. You don't just stay one spot. You think you're staying where you are, but really what's happening is you're sinking lower and lower and lower because hesitations don't just keep you in one spot. You start going in the wrong direction. You don't get to just pause in life. You're either moving towards God and towards something or you're moving away. And the more you hesitate, the more you allow worry and fear and doubt to distract you. Guess what? You won't even realize that you're moving further and further away from where God has you to be. Third question, am I willing today to trust God with my worries and concerns? Some people today have really big worries and concerns, many of us. We have worries and concerns about our relationships, our finances, our jobs, our own mental health, our own security in the future, our physical health. Am I willing to trust God with those current concerns and worries today? If you're watching this online and maybe you're struggling, you know, this, this has been a rough year for you and lots of things. Are you willing to just trust that God is going to help you get over all of these struggles? Look, sometimes you just need to hear it. You need to have other people tell you. I mean, even Peter, who had been performing miracles, needed the Holy Spirit to give him a nudge. Are you allowing the Holy Spirit to give you a nudge to trust more? Number three, a third truth that we see here is that we need to reach out to our friends and our family. Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and close friends. And after they talked together and went inside, guess what? There were many others assembled. I mean, Cornelius, he didn't even have the full picture of what was going on with God yet, but he was already reaching out to his friends and his family. And I thought about that. Are you and I reaching out to our friends and family and telling them what God is doing? You see, we're, we, we've lost sight of something. We don't need to be a preacher. Matter of fact, most often, you definitely do not need to try to preach to friends and family. They don't want to hear you preaching. Even the preacher. They don't want to hear preaching. Now, preaching may be important in the context of a gathering, and certainly faith comes through hearing, and hearing comes through the Word of God. But look, when you're out there talking to your friends and families and reaching out to them, you don't need to preach. You don't need to pretend to be something you're not. You don't need to try to put yourself on a pedestal. What do you need to do? You just need to tell the story about what God is doing. He's God doing something. You know, sometimes in your failures, sometimes in your weaknesses, you can tell a more powerful story if you're willing to share with them what God is doing. A few questions. You know, am I telling the people in my life about what God is doing? You know, do I share with my family my struggles? Do I share with my coworkers what's going on? 
Do I say, I mean, on a simple level, whenever God does something wonderful in your life, do you share with people? Or are you too proud? You're too busy? You're too scared? To whatever. I mean, when's the last time you told somebody that was important in your life, hey, man, I want to tell you, it was unbelievable what God did. We were at church yesterday, and I know I'm always the one preaching, but God really spoke to me, and he showed me this. Or, you know, I talked to someone at church, and, man, they, they, they told me about this, and this is what God was doing. You know, or, or man, it was awesome what, what, what I saw happen, or I saw this testimony, or I saw this, or maybe it's a share of video or something in social media. All these are ways that you're just telling people about what God's doing. Are we doing that? Or do we take it for granted? Or have we allowed the enemy to make us think, well, well, if I try to be something I'm not, well, guess what? God knows you're not all that. The people know it. The only person who may not know it yet is you and I. We know we, we, we aren't going to be perfect. Neither was Peter, Paul, any of those folks. Cornelius certainly wasn't perfect, but it didn't stop him from doing what? Sharing the story of what God had done through this vision with all his friends and family. Now, do you think that every person who came to his house that day received Peter and thought it was awesome? I guarantee you there were some of them there who left the, the encounter, left this deal, and it wasn't, you know, okay, huh, that was cool. I mean, I guess that was good. I mean, you know, Cornelius had that happen. I mean, that's a neat little deal. And that's part of life. When you share your story, you're just telling people what God's doing in your life. It's not up to you whether they receive it in the right kind of way or how they judge you or whatever. You're just are supposed to share with them what God is doing. Of course, we may have to ask ourselves, is God doing anything? I mean, he's trying, but am I so focused on myself? Am I so lost in my own troubles and worries that I can't really even be a part of what he's doing? And the last question on this point, how could I share with someone this week? I'm not going to let you off the hook on this one. How could you share with someone this week what God is doing? Now, already, that hesitation's creeping in. Uh, uh, you, know, you know, I'm going to hesitate or whatever. No, look, I, before you leave today, during the reflection time, this is your task. You think about how you can share with somebody this week what God's doing. Maybe it could be, I'm going to give you one. This is like a cheat sheet, all right? It could be as simple as, man, you know, I was at church Sunday, and I hadn't been thinking a whole lot about what God was doing. As a matter of fact, it's kind of been out of my mind. I got drugged to church by so-and-so. I wasn't even thinking about it. And the preacher said something about how I need to tell other people about what God's doing. And I hadn't really been that involved in it. I just want to let you know, man, God has really blessed me, and things are awesome, you know, in my life in so many ways. They could be better, but I'm going to pray that God's going to help, get, help, help things to be better. If you can't find somebody to tell that to this week or somebody to share something with, you got to pause and really do some reflection about what's going on in your life. Because you see, if you really, really believe that be, having God in your life is a good thing, and that if people don't have Him in their life, it's not a good thing, you're going to want to share that with others. And so you got to think about how can I do that this week. And the fourth and final thing we want to look at from today's text is that we need to remember and that God shows no favoritism. He doesn't play favorites. That's what Peter says right here. And this is, it's even hard for us to really understand the gravity of what he's saying here because we don't understand how much Jews really hated Gentiles and how much Gentiles didn't like Jews. So but Peter says, I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism. In every nation he accepts those who fear him and do what is right. Look, you realize today we got to remember God doesn't show favoritism. He doesn't play favorites. That's what we do in our own sinfulness, in our own brokenness. And look, don't think for a minute that when we incline ourselves toward favoritism that the devil doesn't use that to destroy families, to destroy relationships, to destroy companies, to destroy everything because favoritism is, is what creeps in there and causes problems. And God, listen, He doesn't love you more. Now, on one hand, you are tremendously special. 
but you're not so special. He doesn't love you more than he loves someone else. Now, this doesn't mean that oftentimes you may do some things better. You may be more obedient. You may produce certain things more. You have your great qualities, but God doesn't love you more than he loves someone else. And if you're allowing pride and superiority to make you interact with people in a way because you think you are so much better than other people and that God loves you more, look, you got to pump the brakes a minute. You're off base. God doesn't love you more. But listen, God doesn't love you less either. There's some people who can't rise to be what God wants them to be because they, they think God loves them less. They, they're victims to what other people have told them about themselves. They're victims to their own failures. They're chained to their past, to their brokenness. And so what they think God loves them less because of all the things they've done. That's not true. God doesn't love you more, and he doesn't love you less. He doesn't love them more. See, that's what happens to us as religious people, right? We tend to want to do what? We want to believe that we're in and they're out. Look, when you start thinking that you're in and everyone else is out, you're starting down a path that will lead you in the wrong direction. The best way to think about it is this, is that each of us, each of us are God's favorite. God doesn't have favorites. All of us are his favorite. Some of you may remember seeing the movie based on the book called The Shack, all right? And there's a line in there in the depiction of God the Father, and, 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 and the line is this. God says, while looking at all these different people, he says what? I'm especially fond of this one. But then as the movie goes on, that's all God continues to say, is I'm especially fond of that one. I'm especially fond of this one. I'm especially fond of him. I'm especially fond of her. Well, guess what? That's because all of us are God's favorite. He's especially fond of every one of us. Now, don't confuse how much God loves you as a person and how much he loves everyone as a person with the fact that God accepts everything that we do in equal ways. All the actions and reactions and choices that we make are not equal. Okay? Think about your own children. I mean, some, we love our children, and if we're, if we're acting like God, we shouldn't have favorites among our children. We should love them all and, and, and be, want the best for them. But sometimes some of our children do what? They make some better decisions that lead to some different types of consequences. And that might lead to some different types of privileges and might cause a set of things to happen that, or might, that would be different. Certainly the outcomes could be different, but the love isn't less. Look, on a small, in a small way, that's the same thing with God. Is It's not that he loves any one particular person more than the other, but oftentimes the choices and the circumstances of our life, not just us, but even our parents and our grandparents and the generations before us, all of these things lead to situations where there are absolutely, and this is a buzzword out there, there are absolutely privileges that many of us have. Look, we're privileged to be in a church where you can stand up and tell people about Jesus. And there's zero fear that the government's going to come in here today with guns and arrest us for doing it. We're privileged. You know why? It's because many people in generations past fought and were willing to give up their own very life and their freedoms so that you and I could live in a country like this. Very little worry, all right, that, that when you go to the bank tomorrow that your money is going to be wiped away unless you spend it. It's not like somebody's going to go in there and it's just going to be gone like happens today in some countries. Their whole financial system is unstable. There's no security. So guess what? We are all beneficiaries and it's not, it, look, it's not that God loves us more than he loves those people. It's the fact that throughout ages people have made choices. And people have made decisions, and all of these decisions that we make affect what happens in life. That's how life works. 
which is why you and I have to try our best to make good decisions. Because it's not just us that it affects. It affects everyone. And it doesn't mean that we love or that God loves more or less. It's just the way life works. And when we think about that, we have to remind ourselves. Because we live in a very dangerous time where we could look at the outcomes of a person's life, the outcomes and the results of choices, and we could place value on the individual based on that. Where we would think, okay, because I've made good choices or because so-and-so's made good choices, they're more valuable, they're more important than someone who didn't make good choices or who didn't weren't the beneficiary of that. That's favoritism. God says, look, he loves us all the same. And he's trying to bring all of us to repentance, to come to know him in a personal way. You know, a few questions to consider related to this, because this is applicable in many ways. The first one, do I think I'm better or worse than others? See, in some simple ways, this affects how we interact with people. If we think we're better, well, guess what? We can be arrogant. We can be prideful. We could think less of other people. This is not of God. And some of us have an inclination to that. Because why? Maybe we look to our own intelligence, our own experiences, our own successes. And so as a result of that, we feel like because someone else didn't have that, that we're better than them. Nope, we're not. Now, some people have an inclination to think of themselves as worse. And to them, they focus what? Now, both of them are pride, by the way. And both of them are just as debilitating and just as away from God than they need to be. Some people incline themselves to think, well, well, I can't do this as well. I'm not as good as such and such. They're better than I am. And so guess what? They're showing favoritism towards other people instead of themselves. This is where a lot of people get lost in insecurity and doubt. Now, the other person still shows favoritism, but they favor themselves. Both are wrong. We're all equal. We're all created in the image of God. Do I play favorites? Parents, do we play favorites? If we can. If we have one child who seems to do things more the way we want them to, we have a temptation to what? To play favorites. We can play favorites at work. We can play favorites in any way. But this is not what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to treat people equally or of equal value doesn't mean that everybody gets the same thing. It's not that. It's that we value them equally as God values them. Sometimes when you value people, and here's one of the great mix-ups of this world. Sometimes, listen to this. Sometimes in an effort to not play favorites, you can do the very thing that's causing that. So for instance, if you set rules and you set regulations, okay, and one person lives up to them and you hold them to a standard, but then you don't hold somebody else to the same standard because of whatever the perceived weakness is about them or that, well, guess what you've done? You've tried to help, but you've really hurt. You've done the very thing that you weren't wanting and supposed to do. It's very dangerous, very easy to do. Third question. Is there any prejudice in my heart? Be honest. All of us have some prejudice in our heart against whoever. Peter did. He didn't deny it. He said, look, when he says there, today God has shown me clearly, he was prejudiced against Gentiles. And it took a radical dream and it took a whole big experience for God to work and start working on that prejudice. Now I want to encourage you with this. It didn't stick fully with Peter. You're gonna, we're going to find this out later, okay? Peter, Peter had a great moment here, and he overcame his prejudice. But later on in the New Testament, he falls. And he and Paul have a disagreement because Peter slipped back into his old ways of prejudice. It's part of the human condition. So are you. So will I. We'll constantly be fighting this in our life. What am I doing to overcome the prejudices? Your prejudices against certain people, certain things. Are you doing anything to try to overcome that? Do you even have enough awareness of what they are and so you're trying to work towards changing it? I hope that you are. You know, as we close today, these four things, I'll just repeat them and then we'll be done. 
Am I receptive to God's message? Am I really open or am I just pretty much locked in? Man, I couldn't imagine how discouraging it must be to walk out of here and say, you know what, I pretty much found my groove and I'm not, I'm not open to receive anything. That would be, wow. I hope that you're not in that place. I hope that you're at least willing to receive and open to what God's got to say to you. Maybe you need to look and start thinking about, hey, am I ready for action? Am I willing to reach out to friends and family and share God's message with them? And am I going to remember that God shows no favoritism? You know, as we reflect on this particular story recorded in the New Testament, I'm going to lead us in a closing prayer and ask God to help us apply this. And the last part of what we do in our service is communion. And that's the reason, the basis for this. God helps us. Let's pray. God, I pray you'd help us learn from your word today. Teach us. Help us be willing to listen and to learn. We ask in Christ's name. Online, they won't be able to hear you. They won't be able to hear you online. Oh, I'm back to this again. <sighs> I'm not a professional singer, so I don't know what these things are. <clears throat> Boy, good to see everybody today. The kitchen was so crowded, I had to leave. But it's, uh, you know, it's good to see a crowd like this, although I'm a little concerned because this side's really heavy and this side's kind of light, and we're going to be tipping. So you've got to bring more friends next week to kind of balance it out. You know, uh, as we uh, get ready for communion, it's uh, sometimes we kind of forget what the, the purpose of it is. But, you know, Jesus had roughly a three-year ministry. He gathered 12 people from all various walks of life. And uh, some of them unsavory occupations, some of them hardworking and I'm not sure what all the balance of them were, but uh, from various phases of life. And he took them for three years, and they saw amazing things. They saw him cure people of all different kinds of diseases and maladies. They saw him calm rough seas. Uh, on his words, they watched him uh, basically wither a fig tree because it had no figs for him. And after all this, they, they were coming to Jerusalem for the Passover. And uh, on their way in, I mean, he was treated like royalty. They had crowds to greet him. It was like he just won the, the World Series. And then they gathered in an upper room for, uh, to celebrate the Passover, to remember the Passover how uh, God had provided for the Israelites to, the last step to get them away from uh, the Pharaoh's rule. And Jesus threw a little twist at them. They knew what they were celebrating, but they, it was an upbeat. It was a festive affair because of everything that had happened up to this point in time. And then he threw them a curveball. As he took the bread and he broke it, and he passed the loaf around, and he took the cup and passed the chalice around. He said, this represents my broken body and my spilt blood for you. And all of a sudden, you know, he's foretelling them, I'm going to die. And, you know, from their hero, all of a sudden saying, you know, I'm not going to be around any longer. It's got to be, you know. Everybody was probably in a bit of a, a shock or whatever it might be. But he did exactly what he said he was going to do. A week later, it was over. He was nailed to a cross for something that he didn't do. That cross was stood up and dropped into a post hole that was already dug. You know, that had to be just agonizingly painful for such an event to happen. 
He was scorned. He was ridiculed. He was, I mean, all these terrible things happened to him. But he, he said that this broken body and this spilt blood, I do this for you. I do this so that the things that you have done wrong, the things that you think wrong, the, the, the sins you do, whether big or small, I'll forgive you if you ask for it, and I will present you to my Father, pure and clean. He didn't do that for mankind. He did it for Jason. He did it for Marja. He, he did it for every single individual that will accept that gift and that grace. So he is everybody's personal Savior. You said, who's the favorite? God's favorite. Everybody was God's favorite. God loves all of us. And it's a simple task. All we have to do as we gather around this table, and I'm only going to read one little section because I, uh, it's hard for me to sit up here and read and hold this mic. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26, it says, For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So keep that in mind as you share today's cup and today's bread. Would you pray with me? Father, we, we don't understand how anybody could love us as much as you love us. I know we love our children, and we, we would do anything in the world for them. But you treat us all so special. You treat us all that we are your favorites to offer your son in our stead. We pray, Father, that as we live our lives... We would try to focus on the cross and understand this gift of grace, and we would strive to be more Christ-like in our everyday walk. We ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Certainly appreciate you being here today. Those of us who joined us online, so glad to have you a part of what we're doing. Don't forget some of the activities that we have um, going on. <clears throat> we're doing um, kind of a, a, a drive to collect some food and some items for, uh, for those who are in need this year. So if you just want to bring an item each week, you can bring that back in the back. And we're um, you know, looking to build that pantry. Uh, Todd's done a great job of trying to look for ways for us to, to get that out in a, to, in a, in, to people who really need it. And so that's, that's, that's really the hard part. The easy part is us bringing something. So don't, don't, let's, let's don't drop the ball when it comes to that. Don't forget the adult Bible study meets at 915 with uh, Bob and Todd kind of rotating out there. Maybe you need to join that and be a part of the Bible study meets downstairs at 915. On Wednesday nights, the boys and girls have a, a Bible study that we meet in here. Um, the youth meet downstairs. And the ladies meet in the, uh, in the, in the foyer back there. So, um, and men, if you want to come, you can come and help us with the boys and girls. Uh, we're gonna, we, we, we have fun with them. Mike, so he got his hand. What you got for us, Mike? YEC is a youth evangelism celebration. Um, basically, uh, a lot of churches from different areas, all over the state come together. They have some speakers and music. Great event for, uh, for young people, teenagers in the 7th through 12th grade. So if you know of a teenager that wants to be a part of that, see Mike. And obviously we want to, um, you know, it, don't let the $50. I'm, I, I can speak for us as a church. We've never had someone who wanted to go 
who couldn't go because of the $50. So don't, don't even let that cross your mind. If you know one or two people that need to go and um, you, f you know, feel God speaking to you that they need to go, just get with us and we'll, um, you just try to get them, get them here and we'll, we'll take care of that. I know as many of you will as well. I hope that you have a great week. As we begin to prepare for the Thanksgiving season, certainly Thanksgiving should be something that's a part of our heart year round. And so I want to encourage you in this special season of Thanksgiving to start you know, counting your blessings, thinking of ways that you can show others your gratitude and be a part of sharing that with God. You also have a task this week to share something of what God is doing with someone in your life. You know, one final announcement, this Wednesday uh, and Thursday, there's a very special guest who will be over at Louisiana College. Um, many of you have uh, heard of Answers in Genesis with uh, Dr. Ken Ham. It's my understanding he's going to be speaking at 6 p.m., over at uh, Gwen Auditorium in, um, on Wednesday night. And then he's also going to be doing a follow-up again at 11 a.m. on Thursday. So if you'd like to be a part of that, um, it's free of charge. might be something for you to check out if you can. And then one other thing that you may be interested in is Tuesday at lunchtime here at the church. It's, um, I want you to get with me, a friend of mine. Some of you may remember Whit Bass. He had spoke here a few times. He's kind of an independent missionary, travels around. He uh, has friends with a, a pastor from Kenya who's in town, and he and I are going gonna to eat lunch here. Um, and if you would like, if you're freed at Tuesday at lunch and you'd like to come, he's just going to share a little bit about his story. A uh, pretty remarkable individual, runs a medical mission right in between two of the three largest slums in the entire continent of Africa. He's a pastor and um, look forward to hearing him, meeting, meeting him, talking with him. Um, I share this, uh, my friend was telling me that when they were on the mission trip in Kenya, this is a good thought for us to close with. Um, they were going around the room, you know, praying, saying, hey, what prayer request do you have or whatever? And he, my friend said, you know, he looked at the lack of means I mean, just the whole, the, he was supposedly wealthy and the apartment was about 200 square feet. And, um, you know, it was just, it just seemed to be, you know, lack of means everywhere. And his prayer request was that, God, would you provide means and the necessities of life for these folks? He said, never forget, we got around to the pastor and the pastor's prayer request was, God, would you help the folks that have so much means to still be able to see you and see how much they need you? And there's a lot of truth to that, is we don't need very much in our life. We get caught up because we have so much. And so as we think about how much we need God, maybe that song, let's ask God to start a fire, because I need more of you. Find a way to get more of God in your life this week. I'm going to pray for you and you pray for me. Bob, lead us in our closing prayer and then we'll be dismissed.